God bless you. This is Dr. Courtney Pope, and you are watching Living Devotions, and we praise the Lord for this being another day the Lord has made. We shall rejoice and be glad in it. We are approaching the season of Pentecost, and everything we're doing at our ministry is leading and gearing the people toward that. If you've been following us on Living Devotions, you know we've been discussing prayer and restoring that power. Now we want to really put uh, the focus on God and what is his role? What does God want to do? What does What is he waiting to do for his people, for this planet due to Pentecost? So we're going to start with prayer. I'm going to go to some Old Testament books that you haven't read in a long time, or maybe those pages are real sticky. So I'm telling you now, I'm giving you a warning. We're going to be reading the book of Amos and then the book of Joel. Joel's right before Amos. But we're going to read the book of Amos and the book of Joel. Put it on pause. I'm going to pray. You, you will pray with me and put that on pause so that when I read, you're ready to read also. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we say thank you. We thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you for your goodness and your mercy. Father, we thank you for another opportunity just to impart into your people what you impart into us, your servants, as we labor before you in the word as our spiritual ears are open to hear the voice of your mouth. Now use our mouth and use our voice to convey that message to your people. We will be better because of the understanding of your word. We pray that this word will go forth with power and understanding, clarity and anointing. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I am excited. You know, I say that every week. I am excited and I needed to be contagious. You need to be excited as well. <clears throat> I want to teach something that I really want to preach one day. So some of you out there, watch out because you put me on the right platform. I will be able to preach this from your pulpit or your stage or your platform, your gathering so I can run across and, and just do what I do in the name of the Lord. Uh, the first scripture we're going to read is in the book of Amos chapter 4. The book of Amos chapter 4. And I believe you have that. After Amos 4, we're going to the book of Joel. All right, so Amos chapter 4, beginning to read, uh, reading verses 7 and 8. And this is what it reads in the New Living Translation. It reads, I kept the rain, and this is God speaking, I kept the rain from falling when you when your crops needed it the most. I sent rain on one town, but withheld it from another. Rain fell on one field while another field withered away. Verse 8, people staggered from town to town looking for water, but there was never enough. But still you would not return to me, says the Lord. Oh my God, you need to read that in whatever translation. Now let's turn to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2 and verses 23 and 24. And it reads, Rejoice, you people of Jerusalem. Rejoice in the Lord your God, for the rain he sends demonstrates his faithfulness. Once more, the autumn rain will come as well as the rains of spring. Verse 24 says, the threshing floors will again be piled high with grain and the presses will overflow with new wine and olive oil. My God, I think you can see here the emphasis is on rain. And that's just what we want to talk about for this episode of Living Devotions. I want to talk about the Redeemer of the rain. Oh my God, the Redeemer. You see why I want to preach this. The Redeemer of the rain. And listen, we've been dealing with a year of being in global pandemic we have been a year during this pandemic of watching loved ones leave this life and leave this world just to go into eternity. 
We have seen crime. We have seen racism. We've seen government turnover. We've seen so many things. There is famine in the land. There is spiritual drought in the land. But, we, but the rain that's been falling, the former rain, has been rain of, of persecution and rain of bad days and rain of poor health. You know, you know the saying, we say when it rains, it pours. Well, God is redeeming that rain. Good God Almighty. Redeeming means to be brought back, to be bought back. So that we're going to see here what the price is. And the scripture doesn't say it in the words that I'm using, but we're going to see what the price is for the rain to be redeemed. And the only way the rain can be redeemed, there's something you and I have to do. And there's something that the one who makes and sends the rain will do. So we're talking about the redeemer of the rain. Three points and let's go. I am amped. The first point is I need to talk about abandoned altars. Abandoned altars. I am really just between sermons and I compiled this to be one point. Abandoned altars and my I'm dealing with three words. The first word is repentance. All right, abandoned altars. Now, when we read in the book of First Kings chapter 18, very familiar portion of scripture because it deals with the prophet Elijah. But I want us to look at something real quick and I, I really pray that I don't get stuck on this. In 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse number 30, I'm, I'm jumping into something that I'm going to visit again. So keep your finger here in 1 Kings 18 because I'm going to visit again in uh, the second point. In 1 Kings 18 and 30, the scripture tells us this. Then Elijah called to the people. This is what he said. Come over here. They all crowded around him as he repaired the altar of the Lord that had been torn down. He, the man of God had to repair the altar of God because it was forsaken, it was abandoned, and it was in disrepair. And this is some of the issue that we are having in our churches today. Within the body of Christ, we are doing everything but stand around the altar. Altar calls now, it's like a few go up. The same, the deep, the season, don't go to the altar like we should. These are abandoned altars. But if there's going to be revival in the land, and which will begin in our churches, then we must understand that we must return back to the purpose of the altar. Now, listen at this. Uh, a theologian by the name of P.F. Breezy uh, 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 made a statement in his article re called Repairing the Altar, Rebuilding the Foundation, Reclaiming the Culture of Corporate Prayer. And this is what he said in that um, writing. He said, a genuine revival will come only by the fire of God from an open heaven in answer to some soul or souls who dare to rebuild the altar of God and put the wood in order and place upon it a complete sacrifice and trust God against all odds. Yes, it may not seem popular to pray and, and lay on your face before the Lord or to be prostrate or to get on your knees and cry out to God. It may not seem popular, but let me tell you, it's necessary, it's overdue, and it is the answer because our prayers to God is the price of redemption. It's the price that is paid for the rain to come again. So, so let's deal with that aban those abandoned altars. We read several instances throughout our Old Testament, but here in 1 Kings 18, Elijah, we know 1 Kings 18 as where Elijah challenges the false prophets of the false god Baal. And he challenges Israel by saying the God who answers by fire, let him be God. You know the rest of the scripture. Our God answers by fire. Baal never responded, not even with a breeze, not even with a candle being lit. He can't because he's not real. It's a falsehood. Baal is not God. God, our God, El Shaddai, Elohim, he is God.
but we need to understand something about the importance of the altar that we need. In the tabernacle or in the temple that the, the Hebrews built in our Bible, there were two altars. And the first altar was the brazen altar. The brazen altar was simply the meeting place between God and man. Listen, it was positioned in the center of the tabernacle where horizontal, horizontal beams and vertical beams crossed or met. It was a place, it's almost like making a cross. And that altar was right there in the middle. But here's the main thing you need to understand. We're not talking, about, forget the schematics of the altar. Here's what you need to understand about that altar. That brazen altar is where you first repented and offered sacrifice. You could not hear this. You could not proceed further into the tabernacle without first stopping at the brazen altar. You could not go any further when you entered until you first stop at the brazen altar. Oh, I'm trying not to just teach on altars, but don't you get this right now? We need to first come into the presence of God with repentance, checking ourselves, making sure we are meet for the master's use. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12 and verse one, it says, uh, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, what God is allowing you to do, that you present your bodies, present your life as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God. Holy, watch this. Oh my Lord. Two altars, right? Two altars in the tabernacle. The first, the brazen altar. The brazen altar is where you purify yourself, present yourself holy. Then the next line says in Romans 12 and 1, and acceptable. You see it? Two things, two altars, holy and acceptable unto God because it's what you can do. It's your reasonable service. The second altar, holy, is the first altar, brazen. The second altar was the altar of incense. That is the altar that is the nearest piece of furniture in the tabernacle to the Ark of the Covenant. Oh my God, it's the closest piece of furniture to the Ark of the Covenant. And yet remember, there's not a lot of furniture there. There's brazen altar. Then you have the, 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 uh, the, the, the candlestick. You have the table of showbread. Then there is the altar of incense. Then there is the most holy place, the holy of holies, the Ark of the Covenant. Again, Romans 12 and 1, I, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present, you present your bodies. Number one, a living sacrifice, holy, that's the brazen altar. Get yourself holy. Make sure you are holy. Get the sin off of you. Holy unto God. Listen, the second altar, holy and acceptable. At the altar of incense nearest the Ark of the Covenant, I cannot get there unless I have met God's requirements of sanctification and holiness. Jesus, I praise you. Hallelujah. And we didn't get to the Redeemer of the Reign yet because you have to start in the presence of God. Let's move on. So the results of being, uh, of, of, of repairing these altars is that according to uh, 1 Kings chapter 18, we will experience fire. Remember fire came down, the God who answers by fire. Fire came down, burned up the sacrifice. Fire represents cleansing. It represents consecrate, consecration. It represents the Holy Spirit. So understand, again, the brazen altar, you are given a sacrifice there. You are offering a sacrifice. So fire is involved. All right, so we have the fire represents cleansing, consecration, and the Holy Spirit. Then the second represents rain. We have fire and we have rain. In 1 Kings 18, God answered by fire. And we know now from the prophets we read in Amos and uh, Joel that the rains come. Not only here, but in 1 Kings 18, in the latter portion of the chapter, Rain was withheld from the earth, and I'm going ahead of myself, for three years and some months. But after this, when the man of God prayed again 
rain came. So if fire represents cleansing, consecration, and the Holy Spirit, rain then represents restoration, renewal, and growth. Because we read in Joel that when God sends the rain, the crops will grow. When God sends the rain, there will be renewal in the land. Remember what he said in 2 Chronicles 7, 14? If my people, which are called by my name, will humble themselves, pray, seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. We all preachers preach that, but they always leave out one. Then he said, I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sin and I will heal the land. If we do the four things, he will respond with three things. In the book of Hosea, chapter 10 and verse number 12 in the English Standard Version, the ESV, the prophet says, sow for yourselves righteousness. The King James says, sow unto yourself, sow for yourself righteousness, reap steadfast love, break up your fallow ground, for it is the time to seek the Lord that he may come and rain righteousness upon you. Oh, somebody ought to be in tongues or in the spirit right now because this is where we are as we prepare, as we head for Pentecost. We don't see, some people just think Pentecost Sunday is about shouting and speaking in tongues. You're going to see all of the YouTube clips. You're going to see all of that, the praise breaks. But Pentecost is not about a shout. It's about a harvest. Oh my God. So what are we shouting about if we're not out there bringing in the harvest? When you bring in the harvest, then you have a reason to shout. But shouting because it's Pentecost, see, that's that denominational stuff that we got trapped in that I personally believe that the enemy uses to keep the church started in our spiritual growth. Oh, hello, somebody. Go ahead, Dr. Pope. Listen at this. Let's move on to our second point. Our first word was repentance, and we talked about abandoned altars. Our second word is revival. And with this point, we're going to talk about what do you see when you pray? Good God Almighty. I told you I wanted to preach this thing. What do you see when you pray? Now watch this. I'm still in 1 Kings. 1 Kings chapter 17 and verse 1. And this is where we pray that I don't get stuck. Because for some reason, this one verse defines so much about my, uh, uh, me and my passion for God. In, in uh, 1 Kings 17 and 1. It reads, now Elijah, who was from uh, Tishba, all right, the Tishbite, the King James says, uh, in Gilead, told King Ahab, as surely as the Lord, the God of Israel lives, the God I serve, there will be no dew or rain during the next few years until I give the word. But in the King James, he says, uh, the, the God before whom I serve and before whom I stand. And those words right there just does it for me every time. Because everyone does not have audience with God to hear God's command. Everyone does not have audience. Do you hear the key word there? You have to have audience. You want to be in a place in your spiritual walk where you have audience with God. What do I mean by that? It's easy to get up and preach to, to people. It's easy to get up and sing. It's easy to operate off of emotions. It's easy just to operate off of an inner drive. It's easy. And, and in church, we think that's anointing. But let me tell you, you know the difference with someone that has, that has H-A-S, has audience with God. These are men and women, young people, older folks. These are people who have spent time with God, who, whose ears are anointed to hear the voice of his mouth. They don't take it for nonsense. They don't go to church for games. And you know it's God because of what they preach, what they teach, how the Lord uses them, how they operate and flow in the Holy Ghost. If all you're doing is singing and shouting, you're not showing me how you flow in the spirit. We already talked about being gifted. So there are gifts and there's anointing for gifts. There are gifts that come from God. But have you noticed the gifts that are laid out for us in the scriptures? Do not mention some of the things that we label as gifts today in the church. Your singing is not a gift. You're either called or anointed to do it. God wires you that way. But we are talking about operation of the Holy Ghost. The Holy Ghost will operate through 
your talent. He will operate through your gifts. He will operate through your calling. But there are those, and I'm referring to those that occupy the office of healer, occupy the office of teacher, occupy the office of apostle, occupy the office of pastor, occupy the office of prophet, not just the gift, because all of us as believers filled with the spirit of God should prophesy at one time or another, interpret at one time or another, discern at one time or another, lay hands on somebody and they are healed when you pray at one time or the other. You don't have to be a healer to heal if you're filled with the Holy Spirit. But there are those who operate in the office. I'm on fire. I, I'm not going to apologize. So I think we drove that point. If not, you will hear it again when I read, teach something dealing with it. So in chapter 18, we're still in 1 Kings. In chapter 18, uh, verse 41, watch this. Da -da -da. I don't know. I'm going to go. I'm going to go higher than that. I'm going to go higher than that. Da -da 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 -da. Okay. In verse 36, it says, at, at the usual time for offering the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet walked up to the altar and prayed. Mm. He walked up to the altar and prayed. Yes, I'm in the right chapter. Good. He walked up to the altar and prayed. And this is what he said. Oh, Lord God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, prove today that you are God in Israel and that I am your servant. He goes on to say, prove that I have done all this at your command. We have Elijah going there and, he, and the fire falls as we understand. Let me continue to read. Oh, verse 37. Oh, Lord, answer me. Answer me so these people will know that you, O oh Lord, are God and that you have brought them back to yourself. Brought them back to yourself. I told you what redeeming means. Brought them back to yourself. We're talking about the redeemer of the rain. Oh, my God. Don't you feel this thing? Can't you see it? It's just leaping off at you. Look at verse 38. Immediately, the fire of the Lord flashed down from heaven and burned up the young bull. This was the sacrifice on Elijah's offer. Then fire fell. Then in verse 40, then Elijah commanded, seize all the prophets. All right, so he does away with them. I want you now to look at verse 41. Then Elijah said to Ahab, go get something to eat and drink for I hear a mighty rainstorm coming. King James, I hear the sound of the abundance of rain. Verse 42, so Elijah, so Ahab, excuse me, so Ahab went to eat and drink, but Elijah climbed to the top of Mount Carmel and bowed low to the ground and prayed with his face between his knees. Then he said to his servant, go and look out toward the sea. The servant went and looked, then returned to Elijah and said, I didn't see anything. I did not see anything. Seven times Elijah told him to go and look. Verse 44, finally, the seventh time his servant told him, I saw a little cloud about the size of a man's hand rising from the sea. Then Elijah shouted, hurry to Ahab and tell him, climb into your chariot and go back home. If you don't hurry, the rain will stop you. What do you see when you pray? We have to understand that there is there are positions in prayer. You know that position in prayer. I can stand and pray. I can kneel and pray. I can lay and pray. I can meditate. I, you know, all of these are different things in, in prayer. However, there's a pattern of prayer that we don't do. We, we pray in the positions, we lay, we sit, we, we, we bow down, we prostrate, we stand. We got that. But what we don't follow are the patterns of prayer. Because for some reason, to our culture, to our culture, prayer is just, oh God, you got to help me. God, you have to bring me out. And that's why we think worship is just about singing or slow songs. That's, and we don't go to prayer meetings or the time of prayer because we think prayer is always about begging God, pulling on God and weeping. There is that element in prayer for those necessary times, depending on what you're praying for. However, in Matthew chapter six, Jesus gives us a pattern of prayer. And with prayer, we understand that we, there should be adoration. That's where you worship God before you do anything. Go into your prayer and bless him. Your adoration, confession, 
then that's when you mention, Lord, forgive me of anything I've done wrong, anything I've said, sins known or unknown. So we have adoration, number one, confession, number two. Then number three is your petition or your supplication. Then you go and asking God what you need God to do. Then fourthly, there's intercession. See, when you pray after a while, you stop praying for you. And the Holy Spirit, according to Romans chapter 8, begins to pray through you. And when he prays through you, he is now praying the things that you did not pray or know what to pray for. Whether it's in tongues or in your native tongue language. You, we, the next thing, that fourth thing is intercession. When you stand in the gap, God said in the book of Ezekiel, I look for a man to make up a hedge, to stand in the gap, but I found none. We are too busy praying for ourselves that we don't intercede. And we always like to tell people, I'm praying for you. Someone sent you a prayer request and here you come with a little text, praying. I think some of y'all just got that already in and you just hit one button, praying. No, pray. And you may do that, but do you really pray? The thought praying doesn't mean you pray because praying you need to worship. You need to confess your own issues. You need to bring your petition. Then you intercede. And then fifthly, you end it with thanksgiving and praise. You give God glory because he has heard you. This is the confidence the Bible teaches us in John's epistles. This is the confidence that we have in him. That we know he hears us when we pray. My little paraphrase there. All right. So understand this. What we learn here in 1 Kings 18. Whatever goes up in prayer. Get ready for this. Get ready for this. Whatever goes up in prayer. And don't say comes down. Listen. Listen to Dr. Pope. Whatever goes up in prayer comes down as rain. <laughs> God Almighty. Whatever goes up in prayer comes down as rain. Zechariah chapter 10 and verse 1 in the English Standard Version says, Ask rain from the Lord. Ask God to send the rain. Ask rain from the Lord in the season of the spring rain. From the Lord who makes the storm clouds and he will give them showers of rain. To everyone, to everyone, the vegetation in the field, to everyone and even the land. I have to read that again. Zechariah 10 and 1, the English Standard Version. Ask rain from the Lord in the season of the spring rain. There's a time we have to go before God because God is ready to release. You know that God's getting ready. No, you get ready. God is ready. You get ready. You get ready now. Get into your prayer position because there is spiritual rain. I hear the sound of abundance of spiritual rain. And that's my demand on the spirit for this year in Pentecost. Okay. Ask rain from the Lord in the season of the spring rain from the Lord who makes the storm clouds and he will give you showers of rain. My God, I thank you. I'm trying to be nice. I'm already at my third point. My third point, we talked about uh, repentance. Two, we talked about revival. By now, you can you follow the pattern. By now, you know what the third and final point is, rain. Repentance, revival, and rain. So we talked about abandoned altars, repentance. What do you see when you pray? Revival. Do you see God moving? Do you see that things can change? That's what you need to see. Uh, Gehazi, the servant of Elijah, excuse me, he, he, Elijah said, go and, and see what you, tell me what you see while I pray. At first he didn't see anything, but as Elijah prayed, then he came back the seventh time and said, I see a cloud the size of a man's hand coming out the sea. Oh, it may not look great at the beginning of it. It may not seem significant in the beginning of it. But when you pray, it starts the whole thing from happening. This cloud came up out of the sea. That's what the servant saw rising. You want the, the answer to come from the cloud above. But God already has provision in the earth. And what's in the earth must meet what's coming down from heaven. Good God Almighty. I, now I see why Jesus said, whatever you loose on earth will be loose in heaven. Whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Jesus prayed and he said, Father, let your kingdom come. 
your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. What we need God to do this season when we're saying the redeemer of the rain, we need God to redeem the rain from being rain of death and rain of sickness and rain of bad luck and rain of, of, of unemployment and rain of you name it, you fill in the blanks. We need him to redeem that rain and cause it to be rain of prosperity, rain of healing, rain of salvation, rain of fullness of the Holy Spirit. Oh my God, I'm getting ready to preach and I have to, I have to pace myself here. We have to understand what God is doing. So when he sent, when Elijah sent his servant, his servant says, I don't see anything yet. You keep praying until you see something. Keep praying until you feel something. Keep praying until you hear something. You pray until God demonstrates in whatever manner or whatever form. I hope somebody said, wait a minute, he just said something. Pray until God demonstrates. Put a demand on heaven when you pray. So my final point is, Lord, send down the rain. Now I'm old school, so y'all know that song. Send down the rain. Yeah, and we would sing that song. Good God Almighty. And that's how we started service sometime. But whenever you say, saying send down the rain, send down the ladder rain, oh, that meant we were going to go in. That meant we were going up. So watch this. I want to read this to you. In James chapter 5, James chapter 5, verses 17 and 18. Verse 17, James recalls 1 Kings 18, and he says, Elias, that's the um, uh, by the time of the King James Version in the Greek, Elijah, the J and the, well, there's no J, the Y and the H in Hebrew was uh, uh, interpreted as Elias. So he says, Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are. Did you hear that? See, in 1 Kings, he's this blazing prophet coming out of the face of God, standing before God's presence. But James said he was a man just like us. That means right there, that under the dispensa dispensation of grace, that means stop relig being religious with God and be the real person that God knows you are. And then just do what God tells you to do. I hope that's getting through. Elias was a man subject to like passions as we are, James says. And he prayed earnestly that it might not rain. And it rained, that it might rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. Three years and six months. Six is the number of man. God will allow us and has allowed us to go to a certain point before he gets involved. And he gets involved when he hears the voice of his people saying we are ready for you to work. We are ready for you to move. We are ready for you to show up. We are ready to do God what only you can do. Oh, I hope somebody's feeling that right there. God, we are ready for you to save our cities. We are ready for you to deliver our families. We are ready for you to turn the hearts of the sons to the father. Turn the hearts of the fathers to the sons. We are ready. Verse 18, James says, and Elias prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth, and the earth, the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. My God, oh, but if you were in church, I would tell you, look at somebody and say, pray again. Pray again until, until it brings forth. Pray again until it comes forth. Oh, preachers, don't y'all steal this. Pray again until it brings forth. Pray again until it changes. Pray again until it comes forth. Leviticus 26 and 4 in the English Standard Version says, God says, I will give you your reins in their season. So just wait on it. You've been praying a long time. You've been waiting. But let me tell you, the season has changed. Whatever did not rain, if, if it did not rain in the former season, this is your season. This, you better come on and claim that. You don't believe it? Look at your health. Look at, your, look at the employment. Look at the doors that God is opening for you. Look at the favor that God is giving you. It's the season of rain. You're just getting drops right now. But oh, keep praying until it comes forth because I hear the sound of abundance of rain. My God, in Ezekiel 34 and 26, 
Ezekiel 34, and what a way to end this lesson. In Ezekiel 20, uh, 34 and 26 from the English Standard Version, it's God says, and I will make them and the places all around my hill, back into that tabernacle, get into that sanctuary with God. I will make them in the places all around my hill a blessing. And I will send down the showers in their season. There it is again. I will send down the showers in their season. Listen what God says. He says, they shall be showers of blessings. My God, we read it in Amos that God had stopped the rain over some cities. God had stopped the rain over some people. But in Joel, he says, I will restore unto you the, the years. And that re restoration comes after the former and the latter rain comes together. He is the, re I feel a hoop coming. He is the redeemer of the rain. And all you have to do is get back to the place of prayer. Get back into repentance. Change the way you've been thinking about God. Change the way you've been worshiping or lack thereof. Then you will experience revival because as we pray, we will have to interpret and discern what it is we see and hear in the spirit and in the heavenlies. Oh my God, maybe this lesson is for the spiritually mature. And finally, the rain will come and, they, and the rain will be showers of blessings. The rain that started in Amos as drought is coming now here in Ezekiel as blessings. Our God is the redeemer of the rain. Trust him, worship him, love him, witness for him, because not only is he redeeming the spiritual rain and the rain of favor on your life, he wants to rain his spirit and favor upon the earth. Whew. My prayer for you today is that you will grow in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He is the redeemer of the rain. Neighbor, it's raining. Until the next time, get as wet as you can get. God bless you.